is Jochen Reiner. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Hawthorne Effect, and we want to talk today about clinical research. With me is Jeffrey Chum, the Chairman of Med, Med Alliance and TaxRay. Jeff has a remarkable track record as medical innovator and entrepreneur and has served as president and CEO of Biosensors International Group, and before that held several CEO and board of director roles. It's a great pleasure and honor to talk to you, Jeff. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Jochen. Happy to be here. So, Jeff, from the perspective of an industry leader, why is pristine clinical research, pristine clinical data today more important than ever? Well, it's always been important, but the reason it's, uh, it's more important now is because uh, there's more transparency, there's a higher level of scrutiny. Um, clinical data is not used simply to get approval, although that is the main function. Clinical data is also used for market acceptance to show that um, whatever you're doing is better for patients and proving that with um, the clinical-based evidence. And clinical-based evidence is really what um, physicians and governments and more and more patients are looking at to decide what treatment options they have. And it's the clinical evidence that demonstrates that one technology is, is better for patients than another. So it, it really has become more important um, than, it, than it ever has been. Yeah, thank you for that. And you just mentioned the approval. So if you compare today's clinical trial requirements to those at the beginning of your career, and you just mentioned that, what is different? And based on that, what are today's challenges? Yeah, I think that there's been a constant drive toward global harmonization of clinical practice. And that was certainly uh, led by the FDA, the Ministry of Health in Japan, uh, in China, and more recently, Europe going from the MDD to the MDR, uh, with more and more rigorous requirements for clinical data and more and more scrutiny and more and more transparency, which is a good thing for patients. And toward that end, the uh, actually the FDA recent changes including having a breakthrough for innovative new technologies, requires the FDA to agree on a clinical protocol in advance, which was not the case before. It, before, many areas, geographic areas, had different requirements in terms of what you use a control group or what time points or what endpoints. But um, through this new process, the FDA, they've agreed, one, that 50% of the data for US approval can come from outside of the US. So that would be Japan, Europe, China, Brazil, and that they would agree on the protocol in advance while you're still doing all the bench testing for FDA. So you could be two or three years away from beginning in US patients and you'd be allowed to start in patients in Europe and Japan. Um, having said that, you need a, a global way to define protocols to have the same definitions, have the same endpoints, the same monitoring, the same data collection mechanism and the same analysis. So, um, you know, in, in, in a way that's helped a little bit because it, it's brought more global harmonization. Um, and, and in other ways, it's become even more important to have good quality data that is not bound by geographies. Given the increased sample size of today's trials, Jeff, how can we still ensure timely enrollment of a diverse patient population? Yeah, I mean, enrollment has always been a problem and, and studies, you know, the, the historical uh, comment on clinical studies, they always take longer and cost more than you expect when you begin. And you all always know the best protocol and the best centers once you finish the study instead of when you start. So there's been a lot more analysis now of, of scrutination of the, of the centers and the, the physicians and the capabilities of, of the physicians and the people that are documenting the data and analyzing the data. Um, so that's really become very important to do up front. So you try to eliminate as much as possible the risk of, of having poor data. There, there's recently been several issues in industry where uh, data was found to be less than, than what we in industry would, would like to be proud of. There was a, a question about um, there was a meta-analysis done on pacotaxel showing that there was a higher death with pacotaxel than with a plain balloon. 
So the FDA called a town hall and asked everybody, all the companies to submit their patient level data. When the patient level data was submitted, we found that there were many mistakes in the company's data collection. In, in one case, they had 10 from one group that were actually from the other group. Uh, in another case, they um, they were missing 30% of the patients. So there was a huge amount of patients lost to follow up. And in another, there was uh, incomplete uh, wound care. So one of the primary endpoints, um, they only had 50% of the patients with, with data to analyze. So and in fact, the FDA ended up not approving it. So this was an expensive study that took eight years to complete. And in the end, they weren't granted approval because you know, of all these missing data issues. So, you know, it, 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 and in the past, you kind of, you could have got, got away with that. I think, you know, 20 years ago, in the beginning of my career, you could have got away with that. But now with so much uh, transparency, uh, and it's good. I mean, I think it's good. It's good, that, it's good for patients and it's good for practitioners and it's good for governments that there's, there's more transparency, uh, transparency and, and clarity. Um, and it, there's a need. I mean, I think, you know, the way we've collected, the way we've done studies and collected data, um, it needed to get better. It needed to get uh, to a, a higher quality level. And what are your thoughts about how could we maybe reduce the attrition rate um, in these trials and improve study follow-up quality? Yeah, I think um, you know one of the things that Hawthorne is doing and going to the to the patients and not and not having the patients have to come into a central center. I think uh, and training people to be able to do analysis in the same way. Uh, and also allowing you to reach people and, and, you know, people don't always live where the hospital is. People, you know, people live, disease states are everywhere and they're not necessarily where hospitals are. So, you know, I think the ability to do a lot of work up front, understand the patients and qualify them. Uh, I think to make sure you get good follow-up by being able to, to go to them rather than depend on them, you know, coming in, which has always been problematic. Um, you know, and I think um, having a more uniform uh, view when you get to the patient and, and how you do the examination and test in a uniform way, I think certainly helps the, the quality of the data. Uh, and in the end, it's, it's, it's more efficient for everyone. Yeah, and linked to that, I think it's also to be able to enroll a diverse patient population that is representative. So maybe you want to comment on that as well. Yeah, I think you know that's. I think that's an issue. Um, you, you want you know you don't you don't want to introduce bias in any way. So you want a representative patient population, and in the past you're limited by you know certain criterions of patients that are allowed to compete in a study or that are consented. Um, and this allows you to have um, a wider variety of patients. Um, obviously, you also can, can maybe identify in advance uh, patients that meet the inclusion exclusion criteria and even do a pre-screening before they get to the hospital screening point. And uh, I think this, this allows you to include more patients that are relevant for the study. And I think that's also an advantage. Absolutely. And um, Jeff, so I think we all agree that reward evidence is also important to understand the safety of the, uh, and the performance of medical innovation. And that outside of highly standardized clinical trials, um, and this information need to be collected as well. So we at Hawthorne, we strongly believe in the concept of patient follow up for life. So what are your thoughts about reward evidence and what are today's limitations and how can we overcome these? I think um, one of the things that um, looking at the patient for life does is it really brings in a more intense focus on the patient and gives the patient something back. So, you know, normally the patient feels like, you know, they're a number as part of a study and they're a guinea pig and they're going in. But this really gives the patient the ability to have input in A, whether they get in the study or not, B, how they participate. C, they get information back, not just on themselves, but on the study as a whole and, and, and patients that are maybe similar to them. And they know that this is going to continue. It's not somebody, something that somebody's gonna look at for a year or two years and then forget about them. You know, they're enrolled in this, in this study and the more time frame we have to study these people, the more we can learn and the more it helps not only them, but other patients like them. So I also think it gives a, a level of engagement to the patient and makes them, feel like they're participating 
uh, at a higher level and, and what they're doing is more valuable. And, um, you know, and I think everybody, when you know that people feel what you're doing is important and you're making a contribution, you're more engaged and, and feel more comfortable with the process and want to participate in it and, and want to participate in something that, you know, is meaningful. Thank you, um, Jeff. We're already at the end of this discussion. Maybe you just want to summarize um, uh, for us what are the most important key takeaways from your end when you think about clinical research? Yeah, I think um, the ability to uh, do things in, an, in a uh, very efficient, effective, cost effective as well, but high quality which allows you to get to the market more quickly because you, 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 and you're not experimenting on your, the fewest possible patients that you can. And I think this allows you, regardless of geographic boundaries or socioeconomic status or severity of, of illness, allows you to include all these patients. And it basically helps get good quality health care to most of society more quickly, efficiently, and effectively. Thank you, Jeff, for your time. Um, it was really a pleasure talking to you and get some insights uh, from, from you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you, Jochen.